Go ahead and get out a blank piece of paper. No, this is not a pop quiz. Well, some of you might experience with that as, as such in a certain way. Don't, you don't need to put your name on it. Like that. You watch her and you did. I'm sorry, say what? No, that's what we need. Okay, here we go. I would like you to draw. The mask of that famous deity from the Isles of Winniyakak by the name of Hana Manakiki. I want you to draw up, just trust your. This is, by the way, this, I love that one. Sorry. Camera close up. Huh? What? See, the body speaks, the face speaks before anything else. Which we're doing young today. The mask of the famous deity from the Isles of Lincoln Island by the name of, oh, perfect timing, focus all. By the name of Kana Manakiki. Draw the mask. Kana Manakiki. What did you say? Yeah, it's all. Thank you. Boy, I'm so glad you're running, though. Thank you. Bring my man. The mask up. You're going to draw. Okay, kind of. Don't look at the other person's drawing. <laughs> you're just going to draw the mask. You're going to draw the mask. Of the, the mask of the famous deity from the Isles of Mokinika by the name of Kana Manakiki. Kana Manakiki. Trust me, there's a, there's a meaning in my madness. It's the same though. Kana Manakiki. So I'm going to jump in. You're, you're going to keep working on that. But then, once you're done with the mask, Kana Manakiki, then I'm going to have you flip the page over. Mother Nature loves you if you're not using too many little leaves and trees. <laughs> and draw the mask of that other famous deity from Lukutatunk by the name of Karuna. Who, she said, Karuna. So first, Anamanakiti, then Karuna. Now, while some of you are still working, I want you to come up one and pick it out one to three or so figures. And place them in the sand. And feel the just come one at a time. It looks like you're all set to come out. Right here we go. You pick a man with the thing you pick you. That little piece. Okay, here is the world that was created. Perfect. Okay, come on up, class. Gather around. Gather around. So you're going to gather a full circle around so that everybody can see. That's right. Mina, come forward. Thanks, and keys. Used up 91% of my Spanish. <laughs> I want everybody to be able to see this world. Did you say no? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, yeah. I want you to see the camel in your mind's eye. As you're seeing him, it's it him or her? Him. It is him. Yeah. Okay. As you're seeing him right now, describe for us in the present tense as you're watching him where he is, what he's doing, what's going on. He's making a trek through the desert in the hot noonday sun and he's finding water for his family. Wow, okay, cool. So, but is he alone as he's doing this? He is alone right now. He's, okay. going, to, he's, he's going to find the water source for his family in the hot desert. Okay, fantastic. I want you to put you in that scene. 
as you see yourself there with the cam camera, camo, <laughs> camo. What's what are the, how what's going on? What are you guys doing? The meaning I'm with the camera. Correct. You and the camera okay. together. He he is providing. Because of his size, he's providing shade from the hot desert sun and also helping guide me. Okay. He has something to say to you. What what do you hear him saying? Even though it is sometimes difficult to find things or it takes effort under difficult circumstances, it's important to keep pursuing, to keep going, to not stop, to not give up. Perfect. Okay. Who is the butterfly? Yeah, butterfly. Okay. See that butterfly. What do you see as you see it here? Describe the present tense as you see it. That butterfly. Flying, yeah, where, or what, what's the... Okay, perfect, perfect. So the butterfly has a message for you. In whatever way it's communicating that message. What's the butterfly saying to you? Communicating to you? What message? Can we try to be the fun? Relax to yourself. Okay. Uh, who, was, who was the gorilla? Perfect. See the gorilla? Give us the context. Where are you seeing the gorilla? On top of the tree. On top of the tree. Taking okay. bananas. Taking bananas. And eating them. Put yourself in that scene. Talk to us. Where are you doing? Where are you in that scene? I am under the tree, and the gorilla is tossing bananas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're playing and we're eating. Perfect. You're playing and eating. What would you like to say to the gorilla? You're saying something. What do you see yourself saying? One day I'll climb taller than you. Oh, wow. And what does the gorilla say back? In your dreams. <laughs> In your dreams. Okay, perfect. Is the gorilla willing to teach you how to climb? Eventually. Yes, so the gorilla is willing to you say, if you teach me how to climb, the gorilla says yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Notice, obviously, how unbelievably easy it is to move into the magic mind. The imaginative mind. And then have you tighten your toes, loosen your toes, tighten your calves. I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's wonderful. I'll put you in a much, much, much deeper trance. Magic my role from a low state. But my point is, you can move it just like that. Just see the camel. Boom, there you are. You're in the Sahara, you're seeing it. Put yourself in there. Boom, there you are. Boom, you're, it's like that. It's just three neurons away. And I know there's different folks with different representational systems, as you probably know. Visual, I see what you mean. Auditory, I hear you. Kinesthetic, can you handle it? And I understand that. But most of us very quickly move into image. And it's okay if you hear it or do it some other. Communicative. That's very important. Thoughts, feelings, fancies, reactions. As you did this, as you looked at all this and talked, Luminosity. 
in the English term. It means kind of mythical, mystical, and magical, and all of that. And that things have power and energy and draw us. And when you're talking about the horse, there's something of that. So there's something that drew you to that horse. And you don't know what it is at first. And it's in these different parts. It's a non verbal, non conscious in a verbal sense. And then you start to relate to it and kind of go, oh, oh, it's what? May, may, mayfly. It's uh -huh. mayfly. Well, how long do you have mayfly? Oh, I had her since uh, she was the first course I learned how to write on, and then I showed her all over. And we had her until she passed away, and she was like 32. Oh, gosh. She was an enormous part of your life. Yeah, oh, yeah. We had her for all of my childhood. Oh, yeah. Do you have pictures of her or anything? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 I, did, I didn't realize until I got up there they were talking that all of my idols had some of the same characteristics that you could see from a shark to see that they were all kind of like representations of the independent and setting yourself apart by choice and uh, strength and More like what? Kind of boundless. Yes. Yes. So, and as you see the cheek right now in my time, where do you see it? What's it? You're driving. And are immediately mesmerized. 
And when I open the drawers and they see all these, it's the people drawer, they're like, Animal drawer, things drawer, big things that don't fit in the other drawer drawer. And they are in an altered state. They are in their magic mind. You were in your magic mind. You couldn't help us. And as soon as you start talking, you're talking metaphor. You can't help us. If we had fMRIs, we'd see oral frontal lobes, of course, before. I mean, it's, I understand the symphony, it's all like great. But there's aspects of your brain that weren't hardly true necessarily by right now. Until you can look at that camera, different part of your brain. You're, uh, you're in that cheese. Hold it, man. Not only in front of the limbic, dopamine's being released, norepinephrine, a whole bunch of things are happening. By the way, the fingerprint of that is just as real as if you're actually doing it. I'm thinking about my hand. It's the same. It's all here. When I do custody bouts, the first time I ever meet the kid is with a parent doing the same. It's a marvelous way. The kids, the kids are coming to Gusty Valve, they're under a lot of stress because of the context they're in, the vibe sitting there. It's like, yeah. So I have each parent will bring the child and children and say, oh, well, show them the doors out, oh, and off they go. No, I do not, I mean, I, I ask them at the end, where's mom, where's dad, where's your brother, sister, and perhaps where you are, what are you doing? Because I know that, and sometimes it's very telling. Dad and boy with stepmom and two little kids, new kids. Boy, English, stateside, lives with mom. Dad now wants kids to move to Hawaii. Yeah, for some of all that. Kid comes with mom. They do a world. What he does is he grabs all the tanks I have, like 20 tanks. It says, okay, here, he means just takes over. Here, this is my side. That's all the tanks. And he gives her <coughs> one army guy and some other. He has all the stuff and all this other stuff. And he goes, okay, I'm done. It's a war. She goes, well, can't we have a little peace? And what does he do? Grab the plane. <coughs> No. So. So. I'm just doing that in the testimony. I have to go to court. That's what he's not been yet. With that, and the rest of the family came, we do this beautiful farm scene. Now, nah, that's not the only variable God knows to look at. You start thinking about the other nation. There's a lot of things possible here. But it's a very tough thing. I also remember one of the two boys and the dad. And they, had, they were um, alligators. And they had dad on an island, and they surrounded these alligators. And he said, that's us. And one day they're safe enough to say that around me. So, but I actually code, I, well, I take note from what they, and I take a picture of it, by the way, and I, I think I circle who's what. I then, um, I actually score how they interact. I have nine variables that I'm Seeking contact. Look, look, look. Bring this in here. Reliance. Can you help me do this? Fostering autonomy. Oh, honey, you can choose whatever you want. Being supportive. Wow, oh, that's beautiful. What you just did. Being contrary. No, no, no. Look at that. There should be good. Being didactic. Uh, wow. Did you know the pens were actually feathers in the old days? I just told her to sit in the back and I just told her. And then I do. I total it. How much is contact seeking? How much is fostering autonomy? How much is self assertion? I'm going to put this right here. And how much is contradictory? How much is that? I get percentages. And I will say, you know, the attorneys of the courts, this is not an empirically based system. It's not any kind of formally uh, formulated thing. It's a way to look at this with some comparative numbers, if you will. It's just within this context. And I've done it now for so many years, that kind of baselines, norms, if you will. So I do do that. Um, it's a marvelously, marvelously instrument. Remember one kid, uh, and all he did 
was a blank world. You wouldn't put anything in it. You, oh, you can put a little water. There was cough. She has a little cottage in the black forest. And she has a wet tray and a dry tray. And she has thousands of bodies. She would, have, she would allow him to burn things, she would allow him to do anything else. I put him in a little pool of water. So he, this kid, would build a volcano. And no build nothing, just this volcano, very elaborate. And the story basically was the volcano would of course explode and destroy the village. And you put in any village figures, but it would destroy the village. And my let's say five session rule, if you're a pure dream, just let him do that as long as you want. I did about session five say something like, man, that, that village just gets destroyed over and over again. Amazing how some of keep reforming. I'm wondering if anything's ever going to save that village. I don't ask him a question, hey, but I'm just wondering out loud here. And what he did was, I don't know, wait, build a very elaborate dam system. So that the lava would come and flow and go around the mountain and then miss the village. Now, humans might say, oh great, well now you, you, what you've done is bully him into a comedy. He picked up your message and didn't like the fact to go to being destroyed. So fine, he's going to accommodate you. The Ericksonians and Jungians and something would say, in this general session, in a certain way by mind, you open, invited him. In a sense, you know, there is a door knock in this door, and I think it's unlocked. <laughs> and he grabbed it in his psyche. Because I didn't notice, I did not provide a solution. I didn't say, you know, we should get something to get an aqueduct. You know, that'll work. I'll get the lava out of here. And I just said, you know, something might come along. I'm wondering. And I invited his psyche because his psyche was ready. Hi, Coral. I'm home. Nobody's home. Nobody's home. Not ready. Don't push me, dude. Okay, sorry, sorry. Just tune in here, but I'm drunk. Hey, you might want it. Oh, okay. Oh, I told you the time. Little Bambi. Where's our little Bambi? Bambi, where'd you go? Okay, and little Bambi. Oh, I was a small Bambi. No, you'll do it for now. Little Bambi, and then there was, of course, Godzilla. Tapping over and over, and I kid had Superman from swooping in. After about five sessions. And the kid took Superman and went, <laughs> Little just tossed him. Oh, that guy was across the floor. Okay. <laughs> Have at it. Bambi, thank for yourself, baby. <laughs> yes, Superman's not coming yet. It's a wonderful thing. Thoughts, feelings, fancy, reactions, but just talking about sample any questions. I'm going to do, in a similar sense of psychoanalytic, as you know, unionism as psychodynamicism is a, is a movement less powerful or less um, populated now. But um, there are loyalists, there are studyists, they live and breathe this stuff. So I'm doing a haiku version of it. Don't forget, Jung was Siggy's heir apparent. He was in, in, in Siggy's group. I think it was seven of them, nine of them, five of them. <coughs> they actually, I told you, they had rings. When Jung betrayed Siggy by leaving the fall, Carl, Siggy asked for three. Very, very powerful words. But Jung, in many ways, many ways, was saying, right? But there's a difference. So, he's got the conscious mind. He's got what he calls the unconscious. I tend to like it as non conscious for various reasons. He's got what he would call ego. And ego has a conscious side and a non conscious side. And of course, he's got in that unconscious, he's got the personal unconscious. And he's got 
adapted power electric consciousness. He's famous for it. Putting it on that. So it's early 1900s. Carl's working in an inpatient hospital in uh, maybe Missouri. And um, there's a farmer, peasant farmer, absolutely psychotic, at the end of the hallway looking out the window. And he's babbling about the birth of the universe with the seven seeds, seeds blown from the sun on the wings of the planet. And he goes on and on and on. And Jung, who actually read in mythology and whatnot, in the original Latin, in the original Greek, and comes upon an Egyptian myth that's exactly like word for word in Shinsu. That myth. The hope that she knows what is going on. There must be some. Something going on here where we're tuning in to things that go beyond the individual. This is like studying all these symbols across the universe and it's a big thing to collect it. The most important thing about Jung is the relationship between the non-conscious and the conscious. And that is, it is a homeostatic, homeostatic system. So it's, if I could say Jung in one word, Jung in one word, balance. It's all about balance. What are you balancing? You're balancing various aspects of the self. So the non-conscious is a guide. It's a guiding system. It's compensatory. It's telling you what's missing, what's needed to live a full life. Take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself. It's saying, hey, you want to take loving, loving, Listen to me. Get in a Jeep and go far. And the way it speaks, of course, is in symbols. I love this quote. Symbols are bridges past unseen shores. Just don't get it, it's just people. Symbols are bridges past to unseen shores. It's telling you what you don't know, but you're not consciously, prefrontal cortex really, aware of. That's where luminosity comes in. There's a mythicalness, there's a magicalness about it. Footnote, it isn't good, bad. You can say, oh, you're great, good, it's like you're going to so. But it's a very different assumption about symbols. In the more traditional sense, and the way we usually think of symbols, and the way we think of our role, is we interpret a symbol. We tell the client what the symbol means. Hey, what camel really means to you is your father. Or what? I'm sorry, I didn't carry it, but it kind of means like that sometimes. This has nothing to do with it. It would be very presumptuous of me to ever tell Ed what in the world is the camel means to him. But I can be in a role of co-guide. It helps in asking the right questions and assigning tasks. Help Ed or any discoverer. So I did very briefly in these quick little 38 second vignettes with each of you. Discover what the Jeep is in your life. Discover what the camel relate to the symbol. So you don't interpret, you expand. You relate and expand to the symbol. <coughs> I will never know what a wave really means to me. Oh, by the way, my analyst, you know. My analyst did do an interpretation of surfing and a wave to me. He gave me into what do you think the interpretation was? Think really, this is psychoanalysis. What do you think he said it was? What's what's the what's what's the ocean and the wave? What's me? What's the surfboard? What am I doing? Think dirty. <laughs> Tubing over and I'm getting tubed. Come on, what's happening? Mother, of course it's my mother. What's the surfboard? 
Come on, it's long and it's wide. I like surfboards, but they're not that short. Yes, the surfboard is the phallus. Yes, surfing is I'm screwing my mom. Really? That's really what he told me. Now, is that am I saying there's no way, no way, and they're all defensive? No. Could that be at some associative level? Could that be some sure. But what you would then say, so what does mom stand for? So what does battle stand for? So what does sex stand for? What does that mean? Why end there? Why stop there? What does that actually mean? Mother's a huge on time. If, if I was going to do a new year nose as a sort of to me, it's much more that ocean is the self, the collective. It's a massive energy that I can never control. And I, as surfer, is the hero and the ego. It's relating to and utilizing that energy. Okay. But it doesn't. As long as I'm driving up toy pines and can't help myself from turning down to look at waves, as long as every time I'm to see my boat, then this is wrong. Then it's worthwhile putting on my own to be able to have a symbol in my life. Because it's a symbol that I will never fully understand that's the point. Because otherwise, you're simply changing symbols into signs. Wave equals mom. Surfboard equals balance. It's just a sign. It's not. As long as there's magic energy moving us, it's a symbol. But it's very important to relate to symbols. So then, we got collective, we got this personal symbols, and then we have collective symbols called archetypes. Transpersonal. Every one of you relates to this, these symbols. Transhistorical. We relate to these symbols 3,000 years ago, and we will 3,000 years from now. Transcultural. You relate to these symbols whether you're in Biafra or in Alaska, wherever you are, you can relate to these symbols. The transhistorical, transpersonal, transcultural schemas, the like mega schemas of the human condition. They really talk about the human condition. There's some very well-known archetypes. One of them is the mom archetype. By the way, it's a Hegelian model. No, I haven't really read it. But I know it's dialectic. So it's on the one hand, on the other hand. Every symbol, every aspect has a light side and a dark side. Life, in that sense, is a spiral. You come to the same issues again and again, hopefully that you want to say higher level. So there's the dark mom, the devouring. Who, who's, got, who's got the archetype down to a multi-billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar corporation? Walt Disney Company, thank you very much. And who does the dark mom better than anybody? Walt Disney. Gay analysts are writing probably on another conference. <laughs> to this day, you go into a theater and you watch um, Sleeping View, and you get in that front row, touch screen, and you, and you sit there, and there's that famous scene you ever seen the movie? where the knight, the other hero guy, the prince guy is out there, and the mom, evil stepmom, kind of say stepmom, this. Turns into the dragon. Holy shit, only having the pants on. That is unbelievable. Ah, evil, dark, devouring mother. And of course, we have endless symbols of the positive mom, the nurturing mom, the kind of mom. By the way, that's your rule. If it's true that our expressions are compensatory, but what is needed? When you look at the themes that we have, which actually I should have done that before, so it's still out. We had themes, and remember the themes that we started on the line, so I write those words down. Remember what a lot of the words were? It had to do with empowerment, it had to do with freedom, it had to do with resiliency, how to get there when it's difficult, when the going gets rough, the 
tough get going kind of thing. And would say that is compensatory to the lives you actually lead. Then perhaps maybe in many ways, your conscious attitude, in many ways, as you feel in some sense, powerless perhaps maybe, or strained in some ways, or constrained in many ways. And so, and by the way, tradition, you know, goes for many years. The things you folks come up with usually are those. You didn't do as many nature. You did some nature. There's a lot of times of nature kind of things, trees and outdoors, but certainly empowerment and, and a freedom of understanding. Okay, so you've got the good mom, you've got the bad mom. You've got the good dad. Powerful, protective, kind, little vasopressant. And then of course you've got evil, awful, terrible. Who's the other one who's got archetypes? Down to AT. And just sold his company for $6 billion. In fact, sold it to Disney. Lucas, oh my god, you look at Star Wars? It's almost like caricatures of archetypes. You can do that anywhere in the world now. Just go, go oh yeah. <laughs> He's actually not so much a symbol of a bad dad, though, in a way. Do you know what he's a symbol for? In this lexicon? The sheriff. Oh, yeah, dark sheriff. And here's another guy who's got the, the symbol sound. I'm going to do this sound, and you're going to know me who it is. Jaws! Shook! You do that anywhere in the world. They go, oh, shook, big fish, big bell, shook. Shark, jaws, typically is the great archetype of the shadow. We all have a shadow. One of the things I like about you, again, Carl said, Rogers, you know, I'm not great at anger. You know what's there? Yeah. Carl was great at anger. But it's thought differently than, than Siggy. Life isn't just about sex and aggression. Progression is there. Shadow is there in all of us in all cultures. Will always be and will be personified. Again, don't confuse the bottle for the wine. Cultures bottle the wine, shadow, mom, dad, whatever, in a different look. But the content of the inside is, is the same. So every culture, we will always have symbols of shadow, of darkness, of the part of this. It's, it's the disavow self. We go back to humanism. In fact, one of the ways of discovering your shadow, never mind what makes you feel deep, is you list three traits, qualities, attributes, that you just most admire. Like uh, compassion. I'm big on compassion, obviously. I love compassion. I mean, I think it's vital. Oh my God. Uh, creativity. I like creativity. We can think differently. It's cool. Courage. Take one responsibility for yours, and you have a lot of courage. So then, the highlight shadow aspect, I would take exactly the opposite. Cold, calculated cruelty. Never vary from exactly what you're supposed to do in the formula, whatever the opposite creativity be. Just, not kidding, just feed it to me, I'll just do that. Wimpiness. The inner wimp. And the point is, you have to come to terms with them. You gotta pay attention. You gotta pay attention to these messages from the soul, including aspects of the shadow. By the way, you thought that the first thing you have to deal with in therapy is the shadow. By the way, that's very similar to Siggy. Only Siggy is really talking about the personal stuff. And you're saying, well, it's personal and also collective. There's these aspects. You can also get an image, something that really seems vital. Like, it's 1952. No offense to Alabama. It's Alabama in some little town. And I'm seeing an image, again, no offense to Wayne you but nonetheless, of a corpulent southern sheriff trying on a cigar. Stay. 
we had to see this guy. It kind of is so I mean, one might imagine his views on the world, on various ethnic groups. Right? I'm not just shadow here. Okay. But the ideas you got to relate to these figures. The other part of shadow, by the way, is the unlived life. So, who well, has not talked to today? Actually, you don't talk today because you don't have Somebody, you have five, you have five months. They can be anything you want. Any five months. Give us one or two of the lives you would do. Um, I live on a beach in Hawaii, so like I something like that. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So you'd be this free spirit, just kind of like a very simple, organic life. That'd be one of your lives. Okay. That's probably not gonna happen, is that right? <laughs> so that would be an unwanted life. You're not gonna get to live that way. So there's a genuine, or of course this, but there would be an authentic, genuine, honorable grief of the world about that. Flip on the way over here, there's a great article in Time Magazine about saying the world about grief in animals. How animals grieve death. Amazing. I mean, don't really know if we're not answering the world, but it points up to me. Okay. Five lives. What would you want to do? Okay, so you have the means to do so. Back to that golden coin. <laughs> and my past coin. Just forget that coin. Okay, you're traveling the world. Do you have different houses and different like villas and? Yeah, or just I would just stay somewhere for a couple months and go to the next country and then, you know, it's just experience. Yeah, cool. Somebody else. Five lives. What are you doing? One of them. No, not at all. Okay. I mean, you'd say you could fly and you could be fanciful, but I'm thinking more like these are real lives. It's just it's not realistic that you're going to live it. Well, hey, but how about I mean, if anything? It sounds kind of silly, but I'm a big like, DC Marvel comic fan. Huh? Those people sometimes have real lives, and I have the same kind of thing. <laughs> oh, this, oh, this is so cool. So you'd be a DC comic creator? No. No. I would be like, for example, Batman. Oh, perfect. Just for example. No, you that could be perfect. Yes, we will allow that on the life. But you're Batman. That would make you do that. How come you didn't pick me, dude? I'm right here. It's okay. Right now, I know the more realistic. He's going without a hand like that. That's true. Okay, so there's another one. Somebody else. Artist, if I can support myself. Yeah, if I would think like that. Yeah. The voice, American Idol, all that. I, no, not I that. I never can see that. You can see your artist. But I mean, those shows are there based on that collective dream. We have a collective dream of being. Not you know. so much the fame part, more like living in like a commune of artists. <laughs> it's interesting because obviously one of my own lives would be to be a professional musician, to be a guitar player. And I realize I, I don't need to be the stones who I'm going to see next yeah, time. No. <laughs> so it's it's going to be the opening show in the L.A. Staples Center. It's the model, actually. Anyway, I don't need to be the stones. I like to be like a Peter Spring, who's well known, but it's more than, he does kind of like you, from what I know of him. He plays with all kinds of people all over the place, and um, it's just in that world. That's yeah, very good. Just for the, the sake of the art. Yeah, yeah, cool. Anybody else? Some unlived life. I would not work and have a um, barn full of horses and show around the world. Yeah, yeah, so that horse part of it. Do you still ride? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not as much as when I was younger. Okay. So that is part of our sh all of our shadows. And that's it's, we just have to honor that. They're going to be these unlived lives. If we're not going to get to live, we're not going to do it. And that's the honest grief. The good news is, or I want to put it, we compromise. I play guitar in my car. <laughs> no I'm never going to be Kelly Slater, but I serve every chance I can. You ride horses some, and hopefully you'll make sure you You will travel some. You know, you, you bring those elements in. That's the point. You bring the element. You will get in a chair or some car, and you will 
go. We need to do that some. But you can't do it as much. So we honor those parts. We listen to them. We help them guide us. But there are other parts. There's the student part. There's the psychologist part. Fortunately, one of my lives would be exactly like that. If you can create a life that at least one of those lives would be the one you got, pretty much, awesome. You are an unlucky person. Now, the good news is, again, your selfness, and that's a huge archetype, it's all of you. Your selfness through the ego, which is your identified I, me, will help guide you to the life you want to live. There will be one of those lives. Because if you don't listen, you will become symptomatic, guaranteed. Whether you're somaticized, whether you're depressed, whether you're anxious, you, if you do not listen, I mean, it's kind of pathological, it's kind of obvious. If you're not living life happy about it, you're going to be unhappy. Duh. And whether it's nightmares, or whether it's ticks, the unconscious part is trying to guide you. But that's a assumption about how this thing works. That it is a guide. And that you have to pay attention. And your role as a therapist is to help that person get attention. Yes? It reminds me of the website where you can create a second life and help that kid in the therapy on its own. Absolutely. Because you get to live out of your life. Well, one of the functions of video game. Is you get to live out a life that you know way. Right? It's so seductive. And same with second life. Again, light and dark. The light part of second life is exactly that. Hey, you get to be wherever you want. You want to be a woman or you know, be wherever you want. You want to be cool, try it out. Maybe, you know. It's, again, it's like play therapy. It's like doing the same worlds online with other people. It's kind of cool. Dark side is it becomes more interesting than first life. And there are people who <laughs> spend their first life through just getting the money, it's kind of like being an artist, I mean, to live in second life. And they get married in second life, and they have their intimate, connected, what they're most connected to is this quasi real or kind of faux real life. Some call that addiction. So it's really important to be aware of any contact with your shadow. Because by the way, it doesn't go away. And if you're not paying attention, it'll just get louder. When when it doesn't, when you're not paying, it'll just say, "Wait a minute, you're not hearing me." Let me say it louder. Oh, you're still not hearing me. You become more and more symptomatic. You don't get out of the box. You start having dreams of the walls are moving in. You start having dreams of earthquake shadow. You're buried or whatever it is. You know, always show it. Or you have this dream that you're driving on the road with this beautiful dawn. And you're, you're so happy, your eyes are weeping. You're like, ah, oh, free at last, free at last, hell. You wake up and you go, get you on the road. Heading on the highway. Looking for adventure. Make yourself in our way. So what's the other side of the shadow? Because again, these things have yin and yangs, right? What's the other side of the shadow? the other archetype opposite of the shadow. It fights the shadow. The light? Yeah, which is hero. Luke. Hero archetype is huge. And I've said to you repeatedly, obviously day one, you need to be in contact. We all need to be in contact with our hero. Whether it's Xena. Whoever your inner hero is. Post, uh, French, what was her name? I like to see French. No, she was great. Anyway, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. We love heroes in this culture. And all cultures, but all cultures have heroes. And we always have, we always will. It's a really important aspect of self. It's the ego augmented. It's the augmented ego. It goes out to the world and says, yes. Talk about a positive agent for one's life. One of the aspects of what a hero represents is mega cosmic. I can make this happen. Long, long ago, in a land far, far away, there was a king, and he was dying. And he called forth his three daughters, and they came to his bed, and he said to them, 
Go, go, we must find the gold and what they need to find. Hey, give me a firebird. We must find the firebird because otherwise, otherwise our village and our society and our people will perish. Go find. And off they go. There, you already know the story. Every one of you. And by the way, if I told this story in Zimbabwe or whatever, anywhere in the world, everybody already knows the story. And by the way, if we do this camp sidewise, it's a fire dog. Oh man, we're mesmerized. It's neon lights. It's like, oh my God. So what happens? You know what happens, right? Especially if one, you know, if she's the stepsister or whatever. Oh my gosh. So you have one who is the hero. And she's loyal and devoted and kind and loving and fantastic. And then you got the two evil sisters who are going to yeah, yeah, conspire. Right? And she's going to go through hell and hell. She is going to go through unbelievable trials and tribulations. Dark forests and monsters and all kinds of things. And finally she's going to find the firebird. And she's like, oh. And she's doing it not for herself at all. She's doing it for her dad and for the towns, people, you know, the, king, the kingdom, whatever. And you know that she is about to get there. And what happens? The dang evil sisters come and somehow get it and get the firebird. And they're just doing it because they want to be queens. And you know what happens in the end. What happens in the end? That's right. You betcha she does. The good news is, in the end, she does bring the firebird. And just before Dad expires, she brings it to him. And he is so peace and so... And she's... Her kingdom hints to be a princess down, her kingdom, the same. And if the sister don't die, they at least then go to prison or something. Depends on what they want to do. Because in the old place, they died when they tortured us. And that was sanitized. It's just right there like Beowulf of like, you know, ancient, ancient story, you know. Any story. It's got to have a hero. And always would. And we idolize heroes in the synopsis of this week. And yes, when you're a hero, not only are you epitomizing, embolizing, personifying, embodying the positive agent to the mass, but you also Connected, because everybody adores you, idolizes you, and wants you, and wants to be you. You never have a problem. In fact, all too much now. I mean, this era of tweets and all that, it's amazing. You don't even see the flow, you don't even see the that happen. I mean, you mean dyadic, you think revelations. And we do impact that. I mean, again, Keith Richards, out of our, he talks about here, yeah, he felt an urge to become the, the person that the people wanted him to be. Very important part of time. We've got the archetype of the self, I said. The self is you in the unimonic state. The self is the archetype of wholeness in that moment. And again, it's a alien, right? So you got these opposites, you come to some integrated resolution, and in that moment, your whole there's no conflict, mind, body, spirit, all these aspects in the line. You have some incredible dopamine rush, and some image comes to mind. Mandalas are great symbols of this balance of everything. And then, whoop, something goes awry, and off you go again, and have a good rebalance, or debalance, and you go. But the self is a very Persona. Your social self, how you look to the world, kind of to the shadow also. Being proper. And it's important to have a good persona. Again, when you are going to present your dissertation on your committee, yes, your hero is going to be there, but so is your persona. You've got to dress appropriately, have a little uniform that I wear to work, some of the collar shirt, and print. I mean, that's not how I wear in the world. I'm just shorts and t-shirts and most of their feet. But you gotta, and I take, of course, my shoes off, but if I'm with a Hispanic family, at least when I first meet them, I keep my shoes on. There's some cultural thing here, you gotta be aware of. <laughs> Probably should wear a tie, but I can get away without one. When I go to court, I wear a tie. I mean, come on, man. And that's okay, I don't have to be that much of a rebel. 
Randy Lee, one of my mentors, had hair down here and loved to go in with the big point. He was a child genius. He was a genius. Randy Lee grew up in Philly at seven and on way tangential, but it's, it's a story, actually, of a life. He's in Philly, he's a scrawny kid. He's so brilliant that he does high school and college kind of at the same time. He got his full MD by the time he was 22. Oh, he's a, he's a genius. He is a, a certified genius. I mean, that's what he is. He learns anything and everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's Hegel, whether it's quantum mechanics, Randy Reed's mind just goes, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you read the you know, night before, a lot of things doesn't mean to read. He just looks at the test and can't know. I mean, it's incredible. So he grows up in Philly, in a tough part of Philly. Nobody messes with Randy. Why? He knows how to build bombs. And everybody knows Randy knows how to build bombs. <laughs> this is way before 9-11 and terrorism and all that. And it's like, don't, I mean, don't fuck with Randy. He builds bombs, right? So him a lot. And he really did. And he would go down to Mexico and blow up bombs. Again, this is pre-9-11. Go across the border with all this stuff. And he loved to do that. At least he knew to go do it in the sand dunes in Mexico. He just loved to blow bombs. He's an incredible human being. How did he get the child? I'm sorry. How did he get into like doing child whatever he does, psychology or? He's a psychiatrist. Like, he was a he was a forensic psychiatrist. He testified in front of Congress. He did all kinds of things. But his person, but he he liked Florence. Randy actually was created. What I mean by that is his mom chose the gene pool. He is not of his child. He's not of his dad. They stayed married and all that stuff. I don't think the dad ever did. But Randy's mom. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. And, and Randy wouldn't mind by saying, oh, Randy's very, very cool. And he, um, he knew this whole story. His dad was a brilliant attorney that the mom somehow saw it and created Randy, literally, because she wanted genius. She got what she wanted. She would put, like, she put the word table on this table, the desk. Um, so that he would learn to read and associate before he even learned to speak. I mean, she really worked at making genius. And she happened to get the right gene pool. It wasn't a regression of the mean or whatever. And there it happened. Oh, it's, 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 it's still there. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing. The only thing with Randy is, and, and of course he was so, by the way, you know, so idealized by everybody. Mm -hmm. And he finally fell madly in love with Mad. And he never could imagine but with her, but she was very social and very. She would have, she was very artsy and would have music come over until three in the morning. And he just, he was like, this is a very introverted guy. So she left him. He could not tolerate that. I'll, I'll never forget Randy coming into the office, looking like the Walking Dead, and not the TV show, but kind of like just incessant. You know, I tell myself that I just can't see going through high school again. Because he believed in common and repetition. So he just can't do the high school thing again. We were going to ask him because he got so, so. He also taught a different. So he's going down to teach his class on the day that we were going to go hospitalize him. We get hospitalized in Arizona. Nobody shows up to this kind of little uh, supervision group. He goes home and gets a sock down. He goes over to her house and he gets a sock Changed Tom Lutz in my life. Changed Tom Lutz. He was very, very interesting. Tom Lutz. There's a good friend. Persona, but it's also important that Randy was so great. He, he had his own persona, I never knew that persona was expected. Big time. When he went to Congress, he at least took it in. So you couldn't see. Thoughts, feelings, fancy, reaction. Before he had a Take a break. Come back. 10.30. 10.30. Come back. By the way, I don't know if I said this, the title of this child psychotherapy, you
Another important archetype, the anima and the animus. Great sound. Look at that again. Anima and animus. The, I don't want to say it's controversial, but look at its traits more than it's an anatomy. The feminine, let's call it oxytocin estrogen part of the male, and the testosterone part, we'll call it, of the female. I once had a client who was a CSPP student, wasn't in my class. Well, I've had, by the way, clients from the class, class classes over now. Oh, okay, coach right, I very another way. But anyway, so this guy heard of me because he wanted to go into some kind of a Jungian-esque therapy. And so the Peter said, oh, I took all kinds of classes, you don't want to go in, whatever. Paul's name comes in. You guys make fabulous clients. I mean you'll do tasks and whatnot. You'll say, you know, we don't have 12 more sessions before termination. You don't have people ever say that. That's what okay. Anyway, so this guy comes in and he starts working once in the union thing or not. He is obsessed, obsessed with this woman. Loves, adores, pleasures. I mean, literally, what the little hearts with his initials and hers and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he's Google got that over. Thank God it was his girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, he'd just talk her. Basically. This was before texting and all that. I wasn't texting her. And she loved the back, they lived together, but it was a bit much. I don't mean to talk this much. So he says, you know, it's starting to bug me. I mean, I'm just constantly thinking of her, I mean, it's distracting, I can't keep trying to answer her. No. What would Jung say? I said, that's a great question. What would Jung say? By the way, really nice, simple, Immediate sense of Jung is a book called it should be Man and His Symbols. I'm sorry, but it's called Man and His Symbols. It should be from people and their symbols. But I'm Jung of all people for that sense. But in any event, it's called Man and His Symbols. So he reads it over my God. She is my anima. I am projecting onto her. And she's the personification of my anima. I need to re own my own anima. It's a great. He says, well, you're supposed to be the co-guide. Guide me here. It's like, hey, go get a journal. Go buy yourself a journal. So he comes in. And of course, it's this beautiful tone thing in this beautiful leather bounding. And it's like, he's going to do a journal. He's going to get a journal. And by the way, it's volume one. I don't know. I think, great. And he is wonderful. This guy is doing dialogue with his dreams and he says, you know, if the anima for the man is introspection, the inner journey, relation both to others and self, I'm going to do this inner journey, I'm doing it. And he did. And he's again doing crimes and all kinds of beautiful stuff. And I don't know, three months ago or whatever, he says, you know, we'll call it Sherry. I love Sherry. I don't like <laughs> song so far before your parents died. It wasn't like that for him anymore. Now, correlation does not mean causation. I know. But it is interesting that as he kind of did this and took that mana energy, whatever, onto himself, perhaps maybe he really did kind of deconfect her as his anima externalization. And the animus, of course, the animus. is that part of you? The Amazon woman, go again, see now. Laura Croft. I mean, the good news is there's all kinds of feminine versions of I can kick ass. Don't fuck with me. And that's good. Empowerment is really, again, cause of agency. You don't have to pretend on the guy. I think one of the first ones of that was Buffy. Yeah, I'm sorry. She was a bitch. I remember saying that. That's bitching. And with the girls, the little girls I see, it's really important. I have to do drawings of it. And that's, in that sense, and must be one to die. Okay? Okay? Um, trickster is a nice little archetype. It's 
R2, D2. It's the little, cute, inept, but nonetheless helpful, and sometimes pulls through in the end. It's a little animal that helped you. The uh, Native Americans are very aware of those little coyote things that help them. It's kind of beta man, kind of beta sidekick, but helpful. And in the end, sometimes saves your life or whatever. That's a nice one. I tell you, you dream of a baby, you pay attention to that dream. Again, I can't tell you what it means. I don't know what it means. It'd be presumptuous. But relate to that child and see to it, no my baby, any child, see to it that it's well taken care of. You dream of a baby, you take good care of that baby. Obviously, it's some nascent aspect of yourself, one would imagine. And again, you would relate to that baby. We're going to talk a lot about the specifics of that. Very good. Okay, so we've got some concepts here. We've got these archetypes, they're guides for us as this relationship between non-conscious aspects, collective and otherwise. By the way, there is also subconscious. What's the name of the first person you ever had a crush on? Malcolm. Malcolm, how old are you? Uh, Perfect. When was the last time you thought on Malcolm? Years ago? <laughs> yeah. Subconscious, not aware, when, but if I mention it, boom, it comes right up.
Okay, so it's like, man, I just have all this. Now, for Jung, this whole system is predetermined. It's built into the bioplasm of the being. So the psyche is, we call it whatever, is, oh, I that to get back to it. Um, the psyche is like a little rose seed. Imagine if I have a rose seed. Well, in this little mass, it's about this big, is the potential for the, I guess we call it the stock, whatever, the various branches and leaves, and of course for the bloom. Thank God there's a draw a rose test. In this little tiny thing is the entire potential, the coating for the entire rose, right, to the bloom. Given enough and proper sunlight, enough water, the right amount, so environment counts, you will bloom. You know no other than to bloom. You are destined to bloom. That's what you're neurobiologically programmed to do. That's a pretty bad concept. By the way, the other important architect, just as I say, is the journey, how we get Getting there, the process of getting there. So when you deny your destiny, you try to push up against it for various reasons, it will try to warp itself around to eventually bloom. Be determined. Be in the being. So let's imagine this. We've got three little freshly Goslings, here today with us, right here. I mean, they're like two hours old, if even. Okay? Now, as you know, as you know about imprinting, they will imprint to whoever they're putting here, so they're imprinting now. Okay. Okay. We're getting some, trust me. No? Happens when it's a gas, it's coming back. No? So we got a clothesline from there, angled down to there. Okay? Okay. Now, the analyst and you forget it. That was last period, last class, not this one. Okay, so we got this shape. Come on, no chuckles. It's okay to chuckle. So I've cut this shape out. Okay, you got it? Cut this shape out. I'm imagining this. Can you this? It's a three dimensional mind. The inner architect can see this. Engineer, whatever it is. And I attach it, to me chair, point gas, attach it to the rope, okay? Get this? We got that shape, attach the rope, going this way, okay? I toss it, they're like, they're over here, okay? So now I'm asking this shape is over here, okay? You're with me. I'm now raising the line up, so now it's gonna go the other way, okay? I toss it, It's that 
He's, he's screwing your mom, so to speak. Is the world's going, you know, it's scary out here. I want to be back in the world. I want to be an A again. I want to be able to see it again. Sorry, sin against nature. And the whole issue with castration is the father is into the world, and it's really scary out there. It's scary to join into the world and be the, you know, the we me. Now it's become more me. It's become this challenge of the That's really scary. I'm afraid I'm going to get out of Okay? That makes sense. The father in a certain way represents the So again, the symbolic, unspot, unspot. Here's kind of many kiki. Why did I have to do that? Because a guy named Joel Aronoff was a professor at Michigan State, brilliant man. He was brilliant the young too, actually, interesting enough. I think it was first that I didn't have him on my committee. I said, Joel, I love you, my man. I respect you immensely. I would never get out of here if you were on my committee. I would still be there, perfecting it in very slightly. So he did a cross-cultural study of sounds and symbols. And what he did was basically a language scale. So, for example, masculine or feminine? Masculine or feminine? You're not alone. By the way, you're not alone. You saw it differently. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to go see the architect talk. You're okay. Different ways to look at this, but. Bell shaped curve of reality? Most people throughout most of this planet, throughout all the time, are going to say that's feminine and this is masculine. I'm just going to go Iki, for the most part, and you're not wrong. Some of you guys, and more of this time, I've been doing this for a lot of years. I really should have kept the data because by now I have an actual study. I really love that. Now. But, in this time it's a bit more than usual. But Iki is usually seen in her, right? I'm sorry, her as a masculine sound in Una as an animal Latin, but even other languages, Una as a feminine. If that, I just made this sound by the way years ago. I thought, if those things are true, let me combine sound and visual and let's see if it happens. And more often than not, I'm, and it's okay if you didn't do it this way, I'll say, it's okay, because a lot of you did it differently. Maybe you transcended, you integrated, because that is what this is all about. It's, you know, by the way, the integration of things is called individuation. Individuation is his big deal, his big moment of being totally one with oneself, unimonic, your individuated, for that moment, like being self actualized. So maybe you're individuated more in your way. But Kahneman and Kiki, more often than not, is seen as masculine, and more often than not, has jagged lines. Karuna, more often than not, is seen as feminine and has round lines. Guess what? That's going to be Kahneman and Kiki, masculine. That's going to be Karuna, feminine. It's okay if you did it differently. Some of you did it differently. That is fine. Maybe you transcended. This is going to be, if you didn't tell me, I'd say that's kind of on a kiki, going to be masculine. That's going to be karuna. That's going to be feminine. This is going to be masculine. That's going to be feminine. Masculine, feminine, and sentence. More often than not. It's okay if you did it differently. But isn't it interesting? Built in the black positive. So, the task is to relate to these symbols. How in the world do we do this? Let's start out with... Let's do dreams. Get out this paper. What? Again? Twice? No class here. Holy shit. Oh, What's up with you? But again, it's not. Please. Please. And no, it's not. And draw a middle of a quadrant. Draw a line all the way down the middle of it and across the middle of it. How much do you think of a dream you have? Now, dreams, you know, can't kind of find a way of fashion. Things do the matter that has some home to them. Especially ones that are unresolved and they're not sure. Can be seen in sort of in three parts. So there's in the beginning part, you can walk into your part. And then there's like kind of like, uh oh, mm, I'm not sure about this. He hears a footstep line. And then there's the holy shit part. 
Oh God, oh no, somebody coming after me and I can't move. And you wake up, cortisol levels are peaking. If you're not breathing correctly, you have to go back into another breathing. That's a dream. No, no, I'm saying what you do when you wake up. So, so why don't you think of a dream that was upsetting, not, you know, maybe it's a repetitive dream or whatever. Okay? Somebody got one, they're willing to share, it's okay if you're not. I can share what I had last night. <laughs> last night, caught off the press. Uh, okay, it was, just, it was just like, it was just a scene, but okay. um, I was like trapped in an office. Just okay. Filled with client charts, and I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a very really strange dream too, that I, that I drowned in the ocean, or like, you know, I'm trying to like, stay above water with a little kid, but um, it's kind of a different. Great rendition. Exactly. So you're in an office. <laughs> So this is going to make you understand. You're in an office, yeah. and you're surrounded by shh. What? Charts? Just paper charts. Charts. Yeah. 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 Imagine the mind. Yeah. 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 Ye
famous Carl Sagan dream from Dragons of Eden, and I've had this dream many times, which is you're in the tree, there's some animal, saber-toothed tiger, whatever, and you're falling. And next thing is you, you, in my dream, I never quite fall or hit the ground or get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger, but there's, there's the awareness of falling from the place of safety, the tree branch, down to the place where the dangerous animal is. Fantastic. One other? <laughs> um, so, it starts out where, this, this was like a few months ago, it starts out where I see these two guys that I grew up with, that I went to elementary and high school with, and, um, and I'm, at first I'm like, oh, what are you doing here? We're at a mall. And, um, and then I go up this escalator and I see that they're going up a different escalator and I'm like, oh, well, where, where are you guys going? And we're like talking across the escalators. Mm -hmm. And then at that, there's, there's a moment where I realize, like, where are my kids? Why am I here without my kids? Oh, and, um, and then the next thing I know, I'm locked in a mental institution, and the guys and my whole family are outside. <laughs> oh. Are outside talking about me, and the nurses are talking about me, and they're all like kind of observing me and being like, oh, wow, that's too bad. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you're going you're gonna to need, gonna need to put a fifth frame. There's a reason why I have a blank frame <laughs> Alright, we have a So there's a woman named Margaret Cartwright. Right now there's a lot of folks, but she was one of the original folks who did research in this regard. And she did the following piece of research. She got volunteers who had recurring, upsetting dreams. What happened to happen to me? Depressed! In various measures. So, she puts him in a sleep lab. She watches for REM sleep. Anybody who's done research on a sleep lab must be an insomniac. It's a long and wishy the day. I don't understand why she didn't sleep all night long. <laughs> so, wakes him up when the REM's going, they say, what, what, should be the, what should be the bad dream? Come up with a bad dream very quick. Somebody chasing me. All right, okay. So it's the old, goodbye. somebody's chasing you a little bit. So waking up, sure enough, somebody's chasing you. Go back to sleep. Here's the interesting thing. Every one of you could be trained within a few sessions to wiggle your finger when you're having a sleeping dream. So when you're being chased, I want you to wiggle your finger. Insomniac's watching. <laughs> Sorry. He's watching. <laughs> Person sleep, sees the ram goes, looks at the finger, wakes up, person, hey, what's happening again? Having a dream, being chased again. In the daytime, when they're not dreaming, when the prefrontal is well engaged. I'm going to say one aside thing that seems so tangential, but I'm so sorry, I wouldn't have thought of it otherwise here. As you well know, again, just keep hearing, the psychodynamic approach which is beautiful in many ways, assumes that there's a dream sensor and all of that, right? And the reason there's a symbol is to hide from your conscious mind the horrible content that you can't tolerate. Whereas your own idea is, it's the clearest way that a non-conscious mind can possibly speak. When you're asleep, your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is the superego, which is the judgment part, is offline. There is no way there could be a sensor in the neurobiological point of view. Because we don't have the sensor. Online, it's more likely that you're doing what makes the most sense in that language. You're dreaming unconsciousness, all the phones. So, back to this. They have them in the daytime. They say, look, you know, you keep having this dream. But you're being chased. Let's find a solution to that dream. Let's talk about it. So what should be the solution? Let's come up with a solution to this dream, to being chased. <laughs> okay, confront. Tell him, stop. What are you chasing me for? You start to dialogue with him. You make yourself again afford to be black belt or whatever. You bring a bunch of <laughs> teammates with you. Yeah, we all have our ways. Anyway. Uh, whatever you want to feel empowered. You can hide. You can hide very effectively if you want. Okay. Now, here's the silly but brilliant little thing she did. 
So tell me again what the solution is. Let's pick one of those. You get confronted them and you make peace. What are you ready? What happens? You confront them and make peace. Ding! They literally, literally rang a bell. Well, you know exactly where this is going. They rang a bell while the person is talking about the solution. <gasps> Later that same night, guess <laughs> what? That's right. That's Sleeping, ramming, fingering, rooting the bell, ding, more ramming. Wake up, what happened? Wow, man, running, running, turn around, said, you have to keep running with me. Let's dance. <laughs> now, talk about correlation causation. I mean, talk about intervening variables. Who knows? But sure enough, the depression scales all changed on those people. Now, zillion reasons, and I don't think they had controls, and lots of research that way, perhaps maybe. But great study in terms of the ability to lucidly dream. It's called lucid dreaming. You can Google that. The first that I knew of it and heard of it was St. George Holmes. We've been on St. George Holmes, where I worked for all those years. It was an incredible union based place. And we very much did this. So we would have dream tasks for that. By the way, that was based on a tribe called the Senwe Indians of Malaysia. They were a dream tribe. And while there were vicious tribes all around them, cannibals and otherwise, these folks were peaceful, wonderful, harmonious, and they were lucid dreamers. And when they dreamt of somebody chasing them, they would do exactly that. Turn around and say, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you chasing me for? I want you to teach me things. And if they did, then they would, in the morning, tell, get, gather the tribe and say, this is the dance I learned and I teach all of you. They saw no difference in value or in a certain sense of reality between the dream inner world and the outer existing world. It's a harmonious one. It's compensatory. It's homeostatic, it's a dialogue, it's just, and it's very cool. So, so we would do all kinds of dream tasks. I remember one time, dear, we'll call her Martha. So I'm a head resident, I run a home, okay. There were three girls in the room right below mine. I gave them a room, because they would wake up with horrible dreams, and they would dum, 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 they're sealing my floor. I would never come down, very I. Judy had a dream that she was eaten, some dragon creature. It was all cut up. I said, okay. She's not psychotic. She knows it's not really real. She was very upset. I said, okay, what should we do? Here comes the whisper, two point, whatever it is now. Two point response. Go into the bathroom. We wash it. She knows it's not a real physical wound. This is a symbol. She puts some Bactine on it. She puts a band aid on it. When we were in the day center the next day, what happened? I had a dream of a creature that would call a while and the heels Because we were a dream culture. Everybody understood. We would apply consciousness, the frontal cortex, to orbofrontal stuff. And he would. We'll call him Steve. Steve broke more noses than any human being I've ever met. He would come up to you and BAM! Headbutt you. Oh. And he loved him. He was the fairest. He would love to go around Berkeley and pick up little objects, including glass. No, Steve, you not glass, please. Every once in a while I'd find one and sometimes I wasn't sure. All right. And he loved to go, sniff it, sniff it. Put it right in the face. I just come look at that loved one. It's like, it's disgusting. It's disgusting. Go away. He had a power punch. He had terrible things. We allowed him to collect things that were sick. He had his power punch. It was a nice little punch. It's like Daniel Bowie kind of thing. He would sleep with that couch because there was a pillow. Which amazed me. You know, the box and all the stuff. It's a little but he would sleep with it. And he had this prayer. I love this prayer. And he would say it every night. We had to say it with him. As I enter the night sea journey, I carry with me my pouch of power to protect me from the villains of Now he swears that sometimes when the villains of the dark, he
And sometimes they couldn't find a solution. I mean, say, draw us in it or whatever. We would simply take a gold and silver. And whatever they drew out of the darkness, we would put a gold and silver. It's a very Now, I once dreamed, I was in the city, I was looking for Donna Rennie. It was a love from high school. And it's a, it's a live action dream. And then all of a sudden, this ginormous cartoon, a green giraffe, comes and says, she's there. Well, I mean, I was in St. George at the time, so of course, this is a healing figure. This is a guide figure. So I got a piece of paper about this size. And somehow I channeled the inner artist because I drew a perfect rendition of that green giraffe. He was standing with his big eyes in green, British racing green. And I hung it on my ceiling. And when I go to bed, I see my green giraffe. And that carried me on. I had energy until eventually I left St. George when I came home for summer before I went to Michigan State, actually. I put him on my wall and it just looked silly. So I said, thank you for the times we have shared. Thank you for guiding me as you have. It's now time to go. And I phoned him up and said, I'm not sure where you are. Oh, I know exactly where it is. Glory allows it. It's one big box of all this weird shit. That's what it is. You need a weird shit in that one box. I don't know how to put something. <laughs> so you know exactly what I'm going to have you do in the fourth quadrant. I want you to take your dreams. I want you to think of a solution. That's why you need a fifth quadrant. That's why and I want you to draw a representation of that. Now obviously we're doing this, it's very, you're taking a profound thing and making trivia by just like, eh, eh, eh. if you're in therapy in this kind of context, you should be doing this for the next three years, trying to come to some resolution. No, because it's a dialogue, it's an unfolding, it's a story, it's your story, it's your myth. But just to practice the concept. Okay, so Ed, what did you do? I had a bird that, as I'm falling, swooped down to catch me on its wings. Perfect. So if I was his Jungian therapist, I could use a Jungian therapist. What would the therapist like to do? Anytime you have a healing symbol, you want to relate to that symbol. That bird is a healing symbol. So I want you to somehow relate to that bird. Whether you have something, have you okay? Imagine, see the bird, talk to the bird. What does the bird tell you? Maybe you need to go buy a parakeet. Maybe you have a parakeet, you go buy a parakeet. No, that's a big commitment. Or if you see a drawing or a painting or a picture in the outer world of a bird, get it, frame it, put it by your bedside. Or if you see a little artifact, it's birdish, it's a, it's a tie clip. But you know, you bring it into your life. You relate to it, you live with it. You don't need to know what it means. It means what, how it is you relate to it. It means that it's helpful to you in this nonverbal, unthought, known. What's some other solution? What did you do with your, did you do the repeating uh, yeah. The water went away and now I'm on an island. Perfect. <laughs> Move to the water. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that is the point. I mean, that's I mean, I wish we'd be back someday, but it's how we take these and put it in our actual lives here now. 
Who had, what was another one? It was, it was another one that uh, What did you do with yours? The mental hospital. That's big. <laughs> so I drew like, kind of like a sunny nature place outside of the door, and then I have the key. And my kids are there too. Okay. okay. <laughs> Good. And you were going to share something. Oh, usually right before the tidal wave, I'm saving this little girl and a guy, and then somehow I can save them, but then it's too late for me. So the spider jet comes out and swoops all three of us up. And See, we're looking for the healing symbols and how to relate to those symbols. And remember, I told you about non-dominant hand writing. When you write for your position, use your dominant hand. If you're going to actually like talk to talk to the animal that's about to eat you, when you talk to that animal, write with your left hand with your right hand. It affects different areas of the brain, the more non-verbal, non-aware, conscious areas of the brain. But you want the dialogue. So usually, never mind come to the solution, but usually some aspect of this is dialoguing with whatever it is, the shadow elements that scare you. By the way, archetypes of the light represent things that humanity feels very connected to. Heroes and each other And archetypes of the dark represent things that threaten that connection. So we get to that theme humanity connection. You may have a marvelous dream this week that you may want to. You did say for every dream they're not related to, it's like a letter out of the email or text left unopened. But the good news is, it'll come back. Because if it's important, they'll keep. It's like spam. It's like no spam. They'll just keep like, hey, you're not listening. Come on, it's important. Pay attention. So pay attention to our wonderful. Thank you.